Welcome to Navarra Live. I'm Michael Walker, and I'm joined by Helena, aka No Justice MTG, on YouTube and Twitch. I'm not sure I've ever asked Helena. MTG. Back. What does it stand for? Yeah. Oh, it stands for Magic the Gathering. There's always there's a clear delineate, sorry, a clear lot of through line you get from people who get into Magic the Gathering, though they get into socialism. So definitely wanna uh, definitely wanna minimize the the pipeline at the very least. I just had to um, up my volume slightly. What say, say that again? What was it? Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering. Did you not know Magic the Gathering? I would say no, uh, is... it's a trading card game. Okay, 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 okay. Um, yeah, that didn't. I, that was no clearer to me. But it's a trading card game. Tell us in the comments if you also found socialism via Magic the Gathering. You'll have to teach me one day, Helena. Um, coming up later tonight, we speak to the director of an upcoming documentary that looks at the evidence surrounding October the 7th. A um, really interesting documentary, really interesting interview. And there's been a powerful speech at the Oscars um, focusing on Israel's war on Gaza. There's also been a ridiculous backlash to it, which we will debunk. And we'll dig into the growing mystery about the whereabouts of Kate Middleton. We know that's why you tuned in. Michael Gove is this week set to publish a new government definition of extremism. It's part of a new plan that the government says will increase the number of organisations counted as extremist. That will bar them from having any relationship with public bodies or from receiving state funding. Now, despite not having been published yet, it's already pretty controversial. Britain's last anti-extremism plan was published in 2015. That defined extremism as, quote, vocal or active opposition to British values. So to qualify as an extremist under the old definition, you actually had to be doing or saying something opposed to democracy, the rule of law, or tolerance. But according to government sources, the new definition will go much further, including this passage. So it'll include the promotion or advancement of ideology based on hatred, intolerance, or violence, or undermining or overturning the rights or freedoms of others, or of undermining democracy itself. Now, that is, you know, incredibly broad. You could say that sort of capitalism is therefore an extremist ideology because it undermines everyone's right to have an equal wage. You could say communism is an extremist ideology because it undermines everyone's right to keep their property or some people's right to keep their property. Very, very vague. Um, alongside the new definition, the government has also said it will publish a list of groups it thinks are extremist. Um, the new plan isn't statutory, so it doesn't give police any new powers. It's not a new law. Um, but by blocking ministers or officials from meeting them as well as blocking funding, it will significantly impact the activities um, that groups are free to pursue. In an interview with the Sunday Telegraph, Michael Gove made it clear which groups he had in mind, um, saying this is principally about pro-Palestinian marches. So this is from the Telegraph, or what he told the Telegraph. If we're clear about the nature of extremist organisations, and I think that means that some of the people, and there are good-hearted people who go on these marches, I don't agree with them, but they're moved by suffering and they want peace. But it may help some of them to question who are organising some of these events. I won't go into details now, but we will later. Some of the events that have been organised have been organised by extremist organisations. That doesn't mean that people who have gone on them are extremist, quite the opposite. But it means that you can begin to question, do you really want to be lending credence to this organisation? If you do, fair enough. But now there is no excuse for ignorance. Um, now, one of the organisations that organises those marches is the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Um, I think they seem fairly moderate. Um, we've had their chair, Ben Jamal, on the show a number of times. Um, Stop the War Coalition, another one. We've spoken to them very recently. Um, let's go on. Michael Gove again from The Telegraph. We can also have a broader conversation about the way in which some of what's said on these marches springs from an extremist ideology, rather than simply being an expression of passionate opposition to conflict. From the river to the sea is not a call for peace. When you're saying from the river to the sea, you're explicitly saying, I want to see the end of Israel as a Jewish state. The Jewish homeland erased. Now, be clear about that and be clear about what that means. Be clear about the fact that you know a key Islamist demand is the erasure of what they see as the Zionist entity or the crusader Zionist state. And therefore, let's be clear that there is a difference between a cry for peace and the legitimization of an extremist position which intimidates and leads to hate. Now, as you know, I'm very much agnostic about the whole one state, two state you know, question. Right? I don't think either are particularly likely at this point in time. But it is absolutely not in any way extreme to want a one-state solution 
which is secular, where everyone gets the vote. Right? He's talking about, oh, to say from the river to the sea normalizes extremism, an extremist position. Well, many people would argue that supporting a two-state solution legitimizes ethno-nationalism, which I think actually fundamentally it does. Right? You, you might think that's sort of the most realistic option, so we should go for it anyway. But if you're looking at extreme, the idea of a state which is only um, open to people of a certain ethnicity and people of that ethnicity can move there from all over the world, that seems to be a kind of position that, you know, we shouldn't be too keen to legitimize. The prospect of a new definition of extremism has had some on the right worried as well. And Tory right-wingers like Miriam Cates have come out in opposition to the move. She said this, any attempt to define extremism or fundamental British values is very risky because one person's extremism is another person's sincerely held and lawful belief. An obvious example is where I regularly call trans rights activists extremists for believing a man can be a woman just because he says he is, and that this gives him the right to enter women-only spaces. But equally, I am called an extremist for believing there are only two biological sexes and that you can't change sex. These are debates that we should be able to have lawfully in society. We should be able to call each other extremists, but it also means those views should not be and I don't agree with the substance of Miriam Cates's point there regarding sort of trans rights, but I think she is absolutely right when it comes to this law. I think people should be able to have that debate and still, you know, stay within the realms of, of the law so long as they're not targeting individual people with abuse. But the Telegraph says Gove insisted that fears that individuals such as gender critical feminists and devout Christians, Jews, and Muslims could fall foul of the new definition were misplaced. So he said the likes of Miriam Cates shouldn't be too worried. He told them this, um, it's only extremism if you translate that into a political ideology that is anti-democratic. Private beliefs should be cherished, free speech has to be protected, but there are people who are operating deliberately to undermine our democracy, and this space and the exploitation of that space by extremists has only grown. Now, it's very strange. This is very, very vague. It's only extremism if you translate that into a political ideology that is anti-democratic. Now, the idea, so the only example that Michael Gove gave sort of concretely there that we, that we showed you was this notion of from the river to the sea. Now, from the river to the sea, you know, it could be anti-democratic. You could say we want Palestine to be free from the river to the sea so that we can impose some sort of Islamic theocracy. I'm sure that's a, a possible position. It's also, in principle, the most democratic proposition because from the river to the sea in the secular democratic sense is saying everyone who lives there should have one person, one vote. Right? It shouldn't be based on ethnicity. It shouldn't be based on religion. If you live there, you get the vote, and then you see what government emerges from that. Right? So it's not an anti-democratic political ideology. So to me, for Michael Gove, when he says it's an anti-democratic political ideology, he means it's an ideology I don't like. And the vagueness of the new guidance, as well as the fact that it isn't being scrutinized by parliament, has led to further criticism from within the Conservative Party. So free Former Tory Home Secretaries Priti Patel, Sajid Javid and Amber Rudd have all signed a letter warning Gove not to use the definition to score political points. The letter, also signed by counter-terrorism experts and victim groups, says this, in the run-up to a general election, it's particularly important that consensus is maintained and that no political party uses the issue to seek short-term tactical advantage. We urge the Labour Party and the Conservative Party to work together to build a shared understanding of extremism and a strategy to prevent it that can stand the test of time, no matter which party wins an election. Again, somewhat reasonable. I don't find any of those former Home Secretaries particularly likable people, but that's somewhat reasonable what they've all signed up to. And this is Priti Patel speaking to The Guardian. It is really important that we do not malign the wrong people through the wrong definitions. We haven't seen anything yet from the government, but it is easy, as we have seen historically, to hide behind labels or definitions which sometimes end up being counterproductive. None of this should ever be political. It has to strike the right balance between free speech and how we bring communities together. So often when these debates are happening, my mind just goes back to the International Holocaust Remembrance definition of anti-Semitism, right? Which we were arguing at the time. This is a definition which turns political disagreement into a question about racism, which, which it shouldn't. You know, we should keep those two things very much separate. Um, those were merged then, but the likes of Priti Patel weren't standing up and saying, oh, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism might end up sort of outlawing legitimate speech from Palestinians. They stayed silent, right? Actually, they didn't just stay silent. They used it as a, as a sort of stick to beat the Labour Party with. If you don't accept this dodgy definition, um, then you are by definition anti-Semitic. So not much uh, consistency, let's say here, but 
still, as I say, some of the points um, reasonable, even if the people making them are very, very unsympathetic. So is Gove rushing through the new definition to gain some electoral leverage over Labour, who fear it might be used to embarrass some of its biggest figures? Well, Security Minister Tom Tugendhat was asked that on the BBC. Priti Patel, Sajid Javid and Amber Rudd. They say no political party should be using this issue to seek short-term tactical advantage. And some of your critics think the government's doing exactly that, don't they? How do you respond? Well, I think they're absolutely right and I don't think we should and I don't think we are. I think we've already put £70 million towards uh, protecting Jewish community uh, sites in the United Kingdom and because we recognise that anti-Muslim hatred, sadly, uh, has also risen since uh, Hamas's brutal murder of many, many people, in, over a thousand people on the 7th of October. Uh, we have put together a package of £117 million now for Muslim sites, and we're working together with police forces, with local authorities and with other, others across the country to make sure that we're keeping everybody safe. I guess a lot of this comes down to the language that's used by politicians. And Rishi Sunak, uh, only a couple of weeks ago, referred to uh, protests descending into what he called mob rule. And he was criticised for using that language. It wasn't very helpful, was it? Well, I think the Prime Minister set out on the steps of Downing Street a very, very clear, and I would argue very inclusive agenda on keeping British people safe. And he made the point, and I think it's the correct one to make, uh, that extremism in this country sadly has risen. and We must take action to confront it. The problem with that statement, he classes as extremism people who are going out on a protest against a genocidal war, right? To me, the least extreme thing one can do is object to a genocidal war. It seems pretty clear then that Gove's new definition of extremism is largely aimed at those taking part in the pro-Palestine marches or anti-genocide marches, you could also call them. Criticising the demonstrations and calling them hate marches has been a growing tactic of prominent Tory MPs. And the press around this new guidance has also brought Michael Gove's own history of you could call it anti-Muslim extremism to light. In 2006, Gove published this book. It's called Celsius 7-7. Um, it's Gove's take on the rise of Islamist terrorism in the 2000s. And um, now in it, he argues that the West failed to act harshly enough against fundamentalist Muslims and that blame for that lies at the feet of the left. Now, I assume that's sort of a play on Fahrenheit 9-11 Celsius 7-7 because we use Celsius, they use Fahrenheit. Um, anyway, back to the book. Actual experts in the field found it both laughable and dangerous. Writing in the Times, historian William Dorimple summarised it like this. Gove's book is a confused epic of simplistic incomprehension, riddled with more factual errors and misconceptions than any other text I have come across in two decades of reviewing books on this subject. Um, Dorimple's review rips Gove's book apart, pointing out one error after another and describing him as, quote, the sort of pundit who has spoon-fed neocon mythologies to the British public for the past few years. Um, that shoe still fits today. So this was written in 2007. I mean, there's one particularly revealing example that Dorimple goes into a little detail on. Um, so he says this. Um, Gove is also quite wrong that few Muslims or Islamists really mind what Israel does to the Palestinians and the Lebanese, and that it is what Israel is rather than what Israel does that really provokes resistance. It's sort of saying this is about anti-Semitism, not being against slaughter. Um, he says, in, or Dorimple says, instead, Israeli violence is the principal cause of anti-American anger. Bin Laden has written that it was the site of US support for the Israeli bombing of Beirut in 1982 that initially radicalized him. I still remember the blood-torn limbs, the women and children massacred, houses were being destroyed and tower blocks were collapsing. As I looked on those destroyed towers in Lebanon, it occurred to me to punish the oppressor in kind by destroying towers in America. And obviously destroying towers in America, a very extreme reaction. Um, no, <laughs> we would in any way condone, and I'm sure William Dorimple doesn't either. Um, but, you know, misrepresenting people um, and their motivations, I think is a mistake. And Michael Gove seems to have done it many times in this book, Celsius 7-7, um, according to William Dorimple. Very respected guy, by the way. Um, what Dorimple describes there is, of course, Gove misrepresenting understandable anger at Israel's treatment of Palestinians um, as anti-Semitism. So understandable anger, in this case, obviously expressed in a very appalling way. Um, in, in many other cases, it might just lead people to go on a demonstration. Um, that was 18 years ago, but it's not a million miles away from how Gove is misrepresenting understandable British anger at the war on Gaza as extremism today. Um, Helena, the, the government are sort of standing up and saying, this is about protecting people. This is sort of going to stop extremism on all sides. But it does seem that this is pretty much just designed to sort of target people on perfectly 
lawful, perfectly moral demonstrations for saying chants, such as from the river to the sea, which are perfectly legitimate. Oh, yeah, I 100% agree with you there. I think that when you were stating earlier about the angle of this being an electoral strategy against Labour, I think that's also very true as well. What's been clear to me throughout the rhetoric that we've seen from the kind of people at the top of the Conservative Party, their strategists, and Rishi Sunak himself, trying to create this kind of dividing line where they go, oh, we're not, the, the problem isn't Islam or Muslims in this country. The problem is Islamism. And we've got this, this Islamist contingent, but being very coy about describing how much of that contingent exists or the level to which that it is a problem. And therefore using this tactic of fear to make the next election about the about that specific issue, trying to rerun the 2000s essentially. You'll love him or hate him. George Galloway was absolutely right by saying that he thinks that that's what the next election is going to be fought on. And it's going to be used as a wedge issue by the Conservatives very specifically. What's interesting is you can see where you can see them trying to draw that line in the recent past. Remember that all that blow up around the the, the statue to commemorate Muslim victims of the wars? That is clearly them trying to make some kind of statement to allay the fears of the Islamic community in this country about the way in which that they're kind of being demonized elsewhere within conservative governance. Because of course we obviously the Celsius seven seven is a really good in like historical example of Gove being you know flirting with anti-Muslim prejudice. But you got to remember, it literally was Michael Gove who was the one in position when the Trojan horse scandal was breaking all of those years ago. He was the one who was told directly that all of these letters that were sent alleging a plot by Muslims to take over educational establishments in Birmingham was most likely not real. And he ignored those warnings and continued with this line of thinking anyway. And that's what led to the podcast that we now know, showing that it was all pretty much nonsense right from the get-go. And of course, trying to stoke fear in people is a good way of trying to leverage them electorally, especially when you have nothing else to run on come the next election and have the far right be breathing down your necks electorally speaking. More on that story later. One thing I would also take about the discussion around the, the redefinition of extremism here. So when we were talking in the original part, that's when it's a redefinition of what we had, where they were saying, oh, well, don't have to worry gender criticals, gender criticals, you don't have to worry all of you lot, all of that kind of spectrum of people um, who worry about their free speech being undermined because they might hold opinions that disagree with certain people's rights, et cetera, et cetera. It's only actually if you say things that are anti-democratic, but that specific part was already covered in the initial definition of extremism. That was already covered. So they don't need to update it if all they care about is whether or not someone is being in favour of the lack of democracy or the removal of democracy. So it seems to me that the only justification for this can be changing it so they can be as broad and as vague as possible to target the Palestine well, the anti-genocide protests, as you say, very specifically. I just wonder how this is going to impact with the Equalities Act. So, for example, one of the fears the gender criticals would have, say, well, I mean, if you're going to try and undermine our right to hold our, you know, our beliefs ourselves, as has been shown in the court cases recently, then that could come into, into conflict with how the Equality Act defines personal belief. But there's also another kind of personal belief. We have a very, very recent instance of being shown to be protected under the Equality Act, and that is the belief of anti-Zionism, which is what was explicitly being talked about when we were looking at those who disagree with the colonial nature of the Zionist project. And that's one thing that was being taught in the new definition as being supposedly extremist. But anti-Zionism is a protected belief that he says shouldn't be applied because it's not anti-democratic elsewhere to other kind of protected beliefs. So if they try and do this, they may end up colliding with the Equality Act, which I believe they kind of want to do. I think they do want to change the Equality Act as well. So we'll see where that, end up, uh, we'll see where that ends up. Yeah, that's a very interesting point, actually. It was, it was David Miller, wasn't it, I think, who recently sort of took Bristol University to court and then they found that anti-Zionism, like gender-critical feminism, was a protected characteristic. Very sort of interesting area of, 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 of law. There's lots of people, you know, it's very contentious, of course. Michael Gove has promised that the government's new definition of extremism won't affect those on the right, but Lee Anderson isn't taking any chances. This morning, he appeared alongside Reform UK leader Richard Tice for this announcement. So we're going to replace the Tories in the Red Wall, which means we need a champion, of course, of 
the red wall, someone who completely understands it, who is trusted by voters to tell it as it is, no nonsense, no waffle, clear, basic common sense. And I'm delighted to announce that I have found that champion of the red wall for Reform UK. He's also, coincidentally, going to be Reform UK's first member of Parliament in the House of Commons. He is, of course, a person of great integrity, no nonsense, and is the Member of Parliament in the County of Nottinghamshire for Ashfield. Please welcome Mr Lee Anderson. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Brilliant. You. Let's go have a quick, uh, a quick photo of them. Anderson was suspended from the Tory party for Islamophobic comments about London Mayor Sadiq Khan. This is how he explained his move to Reform UK. I might not know a lot of these long words some of the people use in Parliament, but I know a few short ones. Uh, but unfortunately, this sometimes leads me to be labelled as controversial. Controversial in my opinions. But my opinions are not controversial. There are opinions which are shared by millions of people up and down the country. It's not controversial to be concerned about illegal immigration. It's not controversial to be concerned about legal migration. It's not controversial to be, you know, worried, concerned about the Metropolitan Police and a failing London Mayor and the hate marchers, the street crime and the shoplifters literally getting away with ruining businesses on a daily basis. It's not controversial to fight back in a culture war. A culture war that is sweeping our nation. A lot of the things he said there weren't really extremist. I mean, you, you can be controversial without being extremist. But the thing he was kicked out of the Tory pies for saying, or had his whip suspended, I think they were actually planning to give him back the whip after us, you know, a little time out. The thing he got the whip suspended for was saying, without any evidence whatsoever, that London's first Muslim mayor, you know, you know I, I suppose he's Britain's first Muslim mayor of anywhere, I would imagine, Europe's um, first Muslim mayor of a major capital city, was in the pockets of Islamists. Now, he's, he's being controlled by his Islamist mates. Now, there is no evidence for, for that whatsoever, which is why, I mean, it has to be said, after a fair amount of pressure was applied, he had his whip suspended. I think the Tories were thinking to ride it out initially. Um, Anderson's move isn't much of a surprise. Soon after losing the Tory whip, it was revealed that he'd held meetings with Richard Tice in a Holiday Inn in Derbyshire. But in the past, Anderson hasn't always had much time for the Brexit Party 2.0. And um, this was him speaking on GB News in January. Yes, I can understand why some of our voters are a little bit frustrated and, and angry, especially with the, the migration, the illegal and the legal migration. But reform is not the answer. It uh, leaves the door open for Sir Keir Starmer to get in number 10. So he's changed his mind. Um, he also previously called Richard Tice a, quote, pound shop Nigel Farage. I don't, I'm not even sure he would take that as, a, um, as an insult to be honest. I mean, he's, he clearly is in that job just because Nigel Farage doesn't want it for now. Um, so what has changed? Here's what he told GB News. I saw last week George Galloway entering Parliament, which frightens me to death, and a lot of mainstream people across the country. That's scary. He's mobilising. The rest of Parliament seem to be sleepwalking into disaster, not prepared to stand up and fight, fight back against this threat. So, you know, the Reform Party often sound economic policies, as well as sticking up for this great country of ours, you know. And I've said time and time again, Chopper, all I want is my country back. I want to be able to be, feel safe and my family and friends feel safe walking the streets. I want these demonstrations on our streets of London stopped. These idiots that are out, you know, these yobbos that are shouting murderous, you know, things on, on the streets of London. These need to be locked up. It's all well and good, you know, spouting out strong words from the steps of Downing Street and in, in the chamber. But people want action. They want to see action. They want to see this stop. They want, they want our country back. Helena, your thoughts on Lee Anderson jumping ship and joining the Reform Party? I think we need to have a study on how Labour rights figures just continually drift towards Reform UK. Obviously, Simon Danchuk, somebody who also quit during the Corbyn years, ended up in Reform UK. Same's happened to Lee Anderson, just went through the Conservative Party throughout this. I mean, it's clear he's just a political opportunist at this point. I don't think anybody believes that anything that he said there was said with any kind of enthusiasm or conviction. It looked like someone reading a prepared statement for <laughs> during some kind of a at school or something like that. Either way, either way. 
it's clear to me that he's looking at the projections for his current seat in Ashfield, where actually the competition is between Labour and an independent and reform due to MRP polling is being predicted to have more votes than the Conservatives. So if he's going to run in that seat, his most likely victory is going to be by having a, a reform victory in a three-way vote split to try and maintain his position. He's also just a national provocateur. He's got a show on GB News. His future career is going to probably be more as a political influencer rather than as a high-level politician now that he's kind of not in the position that he had, being the kind of token working-class person at the top of the Conservative Party when he was in the deputy chair position. One thing I will say, though, is this is absolutely the worst possible situation for the Conservative Party. The one thing that Reform UK were missing as a direct electoral threat to the Conservative Conservative Party was f any kind of perception of perceived legitimacy, which they now have. They have an MP in Parliament. They actually have somebody who's going to be there saying speeches for Reform UK at parliamentary debates. And that's the kind of platform they needed to be seen as a, a legitimate electoral force rather than just a meme party trying to siphon votes away from the Conservatives to push them left. And so having a high profile figure like Lee Anderson to be somebody campaigning for them directly, this should absolutely terrify the Conservatives. Because a couple more points from reform meeting into the Tory vote, and they could be like below 20 seats for the next election. And it's really genuine wipeout territory for them. The one thing you can say about Lee Anderson is he's very good at getting attention. Like this MP has got so much screen time, right, across all the channels, right? Obviously, he's got a show on GB News, but the BBC constantly reporting on him. I mean, to be fair, we report on him a little bit as well. <laughs> like, we've all got sucked into this. Um, but, you know, I suppose if what you want is a media career, then he's, he's, he's getting good advice. I'm not sure if there's much of a political future for the guy, though. There is a little more context to Anderson's move that might be worth adding. So back in November, The Times reported this in a secret recording. Lee Anderson claimed he was offered a lot of money to join Reform UK. He also told the Tory chief whip that the party was offering £430,000 bungs to Tory MPs in exchange for defection. Um, Richard Tice denied the claims, which if true would probably have been breaches of electoral law. And um, nothing more came of that story last year, but it might want to be it might be something the Tories now want to look into again if there was a, a £430,000 bung involved. Um, I should say there is no evidence of that, but it does seem like a somewhat relevant story um, in light of today's developments. Al Jazeera has released a new documentary about what really happened on October the 7th, and its most striking findings concern the possibility that multiple Israelis were killed on that day by their own side. This is an Al Jazeera news report based on the footage from the documentary. In the chaotic early hours of October 7, Israeli forces scrambled to engage Hamas fighters. <laughs> Apache helicopter gunships fired onto cars driving towards Gaza, aware that some of them were carrying captives. Without guidance, some pilots said they joined local WhatsApp groups to help pick targets. The idea that pilots have to get information from WhatsApp groups is truly remarkable. It's a sign of the initiative that people are looking for any way that they can get the information. This is an outrage. I mean, what kind of a way is that to fight a modern war? At least 70 vehicles were hit by attack helicopters. To me, it's inexcusable for a helicopter or any weapon system to be engaging any target if you don't know what that target is. Now, my concern is, with this footage, we cannot tell whether they're Hamas gunmen or civilians or possibly hostages. And I don't believe the helicopter pilot or the machine gun operator would be able to tell either. These big rounds have a certain area effect and obviously come at a certain rate that if you shoot at a group of people, you're most likely going to kill everyone. You are knowingly putting your own civilians at risk. The I unit compiled a detailed list of those killed on October 7. It found that 27 captives died somewhere between their homes and the Gaza fence. The circumstances of those deaths have not been explained. Twelve more civilian deaths took place in Berry Kibbutz after an attack by police and army forces on a house there containing captives. Israel's Channel 12 spoke to survivors. 
והם הביאו פתאום טנק. אני אומרת לאחד החיילים, תגיד, אבל אם אתם יורים פגזים זה לא יפגע בבני ערובה? אז הוא אומר לי, לא, אנחנו רק עושים את זה בצדדים, להוריד קירות. הם נהרגו, הם נהרגו מרסיסים, הם לא נהרגו כי רצחו אותם. הם נהרגו מ... 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 מהירי. היה שם ירי מטורף על הבית. <אח> מטורף. טנק הגיע וירה בפגזים. אז היה. <אח> אם זה קרה, זה היה... אם, אם הם מתו כל הבני ערובה, זה רק מהירי. The investigative unit asked the Israeli army for comment on its actions on October 7. They did not reply. I spoke earlier to the director of that Al Jazeera documentary. He's called Richard Sanders. Um, and I began by asking him how many civilians he thought could have been killed by Israeli forces on October the 7th. It's quite difficult really pinning down the specifics of how many people die and in what way they die. We've put an enormous amount of work into this and, and have this uh, a list we've drawn up. We can't pretend it's, it's definitive. One of the oddities of the whole story is that the Israelis farm out the collection of bodies to this organization called Zaka, which is a voluntary, ultra-Orthodox religious organization, which firstly is, you know, they're amateurs. They're not, they're not professionals. They're not trained in this sort of thing. They're particularly not trained in forensics. Uh, and also, to be fair to them, they were simply overwhelmed that the scale of this was something they'd never done before. But it's quite clear that photographs, uh, bodies were not photographed in situ. Careful notes of exactly where bodies were found and in what state they were found were not made. So an absolutely clear and definitive map of who died, where they died, how they died, why they died, will probably never be done simply because of the mistakes that were made in the first sort of 48 hours um, after the massacre itself. Um, now, it's quite clear that a number of people were killed by Israeli forces. The, um, the Israeli newspaper Yediot Aranot has reported that the Hannibal Directive was issued at midday on the 7th. Now, the Hannibal Directive is something the Israelis have used in the past. It results from the embarrassments they've had where they've, they've had to exchange hundreds, even thousands of Palestinian prisoners for, for just one Israeli soldier. They clearly wanted to avoid that happening again. And a directive, um, it, it's widely accepted, was issued to the Israeli military that if, you, if, a, if soldiers look like they're going to be captured and taken off to Lebanon or, or to the Gaza Strip or wherever, better to kill everyone than, than to allow that to happen. Now, that directive was supposedly rescinded a few years ago, but it's been, it's been reported in the Israeli press, or specifically by Yediot Aranot, that it, that it was revived at midday uh, on the 7th, and the Israeli army has not denied this. Now, we, we have uh, two types um, of friendly fire that happened. The first is Apache gunships, which are mobilized from very early on, on, on the 7th. For a long time, in fact, they're the only sort of presence the Israeli Defense Force has in the area at all. Now, we have definitive proof that one person, one hostage, is killed by um, an Apache gunship. But if you actually just look at the footage, and the Israelis released enormous amounts of footage, gun camera footage, I think in an effort to show they were doing something on, on the 7th. If you just look at that footage, common sense tells you in a lot of those shots, at least, they can't possibly know who they're shooting at. Now, we, we scrutinized the data very, very carefully, and we came up for, with a figure of 27 people who are clearly taken hostage and clearly and, and, and leave their homes, are taken from their homes, are taken into the sort of possession of um, Palestinian gunmen but never make it to the fence and die in circumstances that have not been explained. It seems to me there is a fairly strong probability that a number of them were killed by, by um, fire from helicopter gunships. Um, Zaka told us they had handed over 21 bodies to the authorities, which they identified as Palestinian bodies, which were then sent back. They said, no, 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 these, these are Israeli bodies. And again, common sense would suggest those were bodies that were not found in their homes and, and were found surrounded by Palestinians. Again, that may be an indication of people who were killed by helicopter gunships. You then have people who are killed by um, friendly fire from from ground forces. There's one particular incident in in um, Kibbutz Beri where 12 people are killed, and they're almost certainly killed by um, by the Israeli police and army. And we know about this because we have survivors. It's quite likely there are a number of other, other incidences where people are killed by Israeli forces that we don't know about because there are no survivors. I and mean, you you just have to 
it was a very interesting thing as the press went into the kibbutzim, kibbutzim in the day after, um, days after October the 7th. They, you can often hear them sort of looking around them saying, hang on, this, the, the scale of damage here can't have been done by people with RPGs, rocket propelled grenades and, and, and machine guns. Some, something bigger has been used here. Now, some of that damage is fire damage. Um, Hamas were setting fire to houses to try and drive people out of their their safe rooms. And so, you know, sometimes houses are destroyed by fire, and that, that is very likely to be Hamas. But a lot of houses are, are ruined; that they just collapsed and had not been burned down. They'd clearly been hit by Israeli fire. So we came up with a figure of eighteen people where we're quite certain were killed um, by Israeli ground forces. But again, there's a potential larger number of people who were found under the rubble of their destroyed home, and we simply don't know how they died. Having watched the documentary, it seems there's, there's two big arguments you're making about both Israel and the Western media, which is that many of the sort of sadistic atrocities um, that we heard about were exaggerated or, or simply didn't happen. And also, Israeli forces did kill some Israelis, you know, so-called friendly fire. Let's be clear, though, because you did also show um, that Hamas committed lots of war crimes and, and killed lots of people, right? So can you talk about that, please? This film is not an apologia for Hamas and the other people who passed through the fence that day. Um, we, okay, we've identified people who were, were killed by the Israelis. They are a small minority. Even, even the highest possible number of people who were killed by the Israelis remain a small minority of the overall number of unarmed civilians who were killed that day. Um, you watch the first half of the film, and we lay it out in, in graphic detail, just exactly what Hamas do do that day and they kill almost 800 unarmed civilians that is absolutely clear and we shouldn't shy away from that we then spend the second half of the, of the film talking about what hamas did not do and this is specifically the sort of butchering and murdering and mutilating of babies and widespread and systematic rape now this is not pedantry this is not nitpicking you know we're not saying all people died in this way they rather than in that way it's significant because in justifying the scale and the ferocity of the Israeli response, of the assault on the Gaza Strip and the bombardment and the number of civilian casualties, again and again, Israeli and Western politicians reference babies and rape. It's what's used again and again to justify this, the, the, the savagery of the Israeli response. Now, Let's break them down. Um, the babies, in a way, is pretty straightforward, I'm afraid. You look at the list of the dead. There are two babies there. One baby is killed um, when a bullet is fired through the door of a, a safe room in Kibbutz Beri. The other baby, uh, the mother is hit uh, in her car, uh, and there's an emergency cesarean, and the baby dies. So those are the two babies that die on um, October the 7th. Neither is beheaded, neither is burned. So every story you see about babies um, that is not does not correspond to those two, and there are a lot of stories about babies is untrue. Okay, and and that immediately flags up for you that there is a, there is a huge problem with information that is coming from first responders, from Israeli army officials, and from Israeli government officials. There is huge problem, and if there is a huge problem of that with babies, then there's likely to be a big problem in other areas. Now let's turn to the, the very vexed and fraught issue of, of rape. The um, Israelis maintain they've been rather abandoned by feminists around the world who don't seem to regard the suffering of Israeli women as seriously as they would others. Now, again, we, we've looked into this very, very carefully. Um, for, 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 firstly, we're not saying there were no rapes on um, October the 7th. There may, there, there quite possibly will have been. I, invariably, when young men have guns and are licensed to commit violence, there is sexual violence, invariably. So we're not saying there was no rape at all. Um, we simply don't know. What there clearly was not was a widespread, systematic, weaponized, instrumentalized rape. And we, we say that because there simply isn't the evidence for it. Um, you look at the visual evidence, we've looked at seven hours of footage from October the 7th, dash cams and body cams from dead Hamas fighters, CCTV and, and that sort of thing. And there is no, there's no indication of sexual violence on that material, none at all. You then have thousands of post-mortem photos. None of, I mean, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll point to an image of a, a woman with blood on her trousers. I mean, you know, really, if that is the strongest evidence they have, it's, it's really not very strong. And the Israelis keep referencing um, images. They, they talk a lot about 
um, young women tied to trees, tied to posts, um, with their lower half of their clothing removed. But there's no images of this. There's no images at all. Now, Zaka says, well, look, we weren't asked to take images. We weren't systematically doing this. It's not what we're trained for and so on. Even so, it's it's surprising not to have a single image that supports, that really supports the idea that, that there was widespread rape or, or rape at all, in fact, is odd and raises questions. There was, of course, one image which we, we took rather seriously and looked into quite closely, uh, a young woman who is killed um, nine miles north of the music festival site. There, there, there is a very graphic video of her, of her that was put up online by the Israelis. Um, they, they did blur it, but um, you can see she's not wearing any underwear. Uh, and this, she's lying by a roadside, by a main roadside. This was held up. And, and this became the centerpiece of a report in the New York Times, um, where the New York Times was alleging widespread and systematic rape. And it fell apart within days because the family came out and said, hold on, we know we know she wasn't raped. They'd received a text from her just a few minutes before she died. Also, very importantly, her husband, who I believe subsequently died, from the moment she died and for 44 minutes afterwards, was on the phone to his brother and never never mentioned a rape in, in the course of this whole um, conversation. So that evidence is simply missing. It's very striking that it's missing. There's no forensic evidence. Uh, again, they can point to the chaos of the day and, and, and so on, but there is, you know, the fact is there is no um, forensic evidence. The, the other thing, again, you know, I'd invite you just to apply, apply journalistic common sense here. The alleg there, there, there are a couple of witnesses, okay? There's one or two others who've been interviewed by individual journalists, but then seem to have disappeared. But there's a couple of witnesses who we include in the film. Um, now, these rapes are supposedly happening at the, the music festival site, which is an open site. It's an outdoor festival. And although hundreds of people are killed at that music festival, the vast, you know, the overwhelming majority of people are not killed. The, the majority of people there survive. There are thousands of people there, and the majority survive. Again, there can be explanations for this. Um, people are traumatized. They may not come forward for some time, and all this is true. Even so, common sense says you would expect more witnesses. If, if people are being raped out in the open or, or on a widespread scale, certainly you would expect more witnesses. The two witnesses that have come forward, uh, one of them a police witness who is anonymous, also says she saw gunmen carrying the severed heads of three women around, which no one else saw. Um, and the one who is not anonymous um, Again, I mean, it's striking. He's hiding behind a bush. There are five other people behind the bush with him, and none of them have said they saw a rape. So I'm, you know, I'm not disputing what he says. You know, he, you know, that he's given his testimony. He's given it a number of times. Um, but even with the witnesses, there are there are you know, one or two questions spring to mind. So I've given you a very long answer there. But it, you know, it's obviously a very important uh, and, and fraught and sensitive subject. And having looked at the evidence very carefully, we simply feel there is not there is not the evidence for widespread and systematic rape and uh, human rights watch very very reputable very serious human rights organization is doing a very in-depth study and i would urge people before they reach final conclusions to wait and read the human rights watch report in a couple of months You've talked there about sort of the approach that one should take to to testimony um, and i know that immediately after october 7th i was quite surprised at sort of how basically all the TV channels and journalists were speaking to people from this organization, Zaka, and especially one of their leaders called Yossi Landau, as if what they were saying was, was gospel. And this wasn't just sort of right-wing media outlets. Channel 4 News, I distinctly remember, sort of had a, had a somewhat fawning interview with him, in fact. And you demonstrate, I think, very well in your documentary that many of the things that this man, Yossi Landau, told the media couldn't possibly be true. Where do you think the media has gone wrong in sort of listening and amplifying um, people's testimony? Because obviously, you know, the media shouldn't ignore testimony from first responders, but I, clearly something has gone wrong here. Firstly, to be fair to the media, um, you know, you, you, you assume you're being told the truth by, by first responders. Why, why wouldn't you be being told the truth? 
Then, to be fair to the first responders, I think they were quite traumatized. They had seen dreadful things. They were overwhelmed. Um, as Zachary itself eventually said, they are not forensically trained and were often providing interpretations of things they've seen, but th they had no qualifications um, to present. I think what was unforgivable is as the days went by, that the media didn't start to scrutinize more. And with the babies, the, the 14 beha babies, many of whom were beheaded, I mean, that actually began to unravel fairly quickly, uh, that. Um, and once that had unraveled, at, at that point, skepticism should have kicked in. Uh, and once skepticism had kicked in, it should also have been applied to the, the sexual violence issue. And, th and that's where I think the media, the Western media, really failed. Western media and Western politicians. I mean, the, the Israeli government was quite happy to parrot all this stuff. And you see in our film, you see Biden picking it up, you see David Lammy uh, picking it up. Um, you, you know, they ought to have questioned it. And the media, the, the Western media ought to have been questioning it. And on the sexual violence thing, The Guardian, the BBC, the New York Times all did very similar pieces where they when you read it really carefully, they were clearly taking almost all their information from Israeli officials and first responders. And it's it's rather surprising they weren't exercising more skepticism and scrutiny at that point. So um, you've, you've talked about the extent to which sort of the Western media took for granted that Hamas had done things which it doesn't seem there is sufficient evidence to say they in fact did. And you sort of said that that's incredibly relevant because it is. You know, it's, it, it's by posing this image of absolute disgust. These were sort of sadistic, depraved people that, ju that the justification for a genocidal war has sort of be, been made. Um, but you are clear that Hamas did commit war crimes. And I suppose after investigating this incident and making this documentary, do you feel that you are any wiser as to what Hamas were trying to do on, on that day? What do we know they did? And do you have a sense of why they did it, what they were thinking? I think it's very straightforward why they did it. And I think um, Dr. Bassam Naim in, in our film explains it. One of the, again, very peculiar things about Western coverage is in all, all the Western coverage I've seen, people never reference the Great March of Return. In 2018, 2019, Palestinians in the Gaza Strip peacefully demonstrated for months on end, um, you know, demanding a return to their lands, freedom, justice, um, and, uh, and so on. And, and the Israelis simply lined up behind some bombs and shot them. You know, the hundreds were killed. Um, you know, there was a very clear, peaceful, mass protest movement, uh, and it was brutally crushed. Um, over 60 people were killed in a single day on one day. And, you know, frankly, bluntly, here in Britain, we spent the whole of that period talking about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. You know, and uh, and it was it was it was remarkable. It was extraordinary. They made these enormous sacrifices. The Palestinians basically worked out that they had to die in very large numbers to make headlines in the West, and they did die in very large numbers. And they they didn't really make the headlines in the West. It made no difference at all. Now, Dr. Naim in our film says, and I and I think there's no reason not to take this absolutely at face value. That many times they discussed. In, in the sort of national council of the um, of Hamas, what are we going to do? What do we do? I mean, we, we we either sit here and die, or we have to do something. And they decided to do something, and, and this is what they did. Now, why they killed so many civilians? Because um, they could have done this, and they you know they could have bypassed the kibbutzim. They, they could have purely attacked military targets because there are plenty of military targets around the um, the Gaza Strip. I, I think the game plan was to take hostages, was to take hostages uh, um, as much as possible. Um, I think, and again, I hope this is clear in the film, they were taken by surprise by the success. They hadn't expected the Israeli military to just fold in front of them. I mean, it's extraordinary. Um, you've got, you remember the reputation the Israeli military has. You know, I think this is why some sort of wild conspiracy theories started to do the rounds in the days after October the 7th. It was astonishing, the Israeli intelligence and military failure. And it, it meant that Hamas suddenly found themselves, you know, masters of the terrain. They, they, they had freedom of movement. At that point, and again, we make this point in the film, I think their, their deficiencies as a military organization were revealed. Basically, the way it works in, in war is young men with guns will behave badly 
uh, if you let them. Okay, young men with guns, yeah, a significant proportion of young men with guns, given license to do what they want, will behave very badly. That's a pretty much a given in war. What stops them doing that is good leadership, uh, particularly good sort of platoon level, ground level leadership. And it was quite clear Hamas didn't have that. So once they were there, they, they had free reign in the kibbutzes and so on. Um, the, the leadership to rein in these young men was was lacking. I and mean, in fact, in the footage I've seen, the, the sort of company commanders and platoon commanders, whatever they are, are, are engaging in it as, as well. So um, I can certainly see what Hamas were trying to do uh, strategically, politically, and so on. And th- there's an obvious logic to, th- to that. Um, the wholesale killing of civilians, first and foremost, obviously, is, is morally wrong. It's wrong, whoever does it. Um, but secondly, it, was, it seems to me it was strategically, tactically wrong as well, because it, it did give the Israelis initially at least an enormous amount of moral capital, which they were, they were quite prepared to make use of. You look back throughout history, when you have slave uprisings, when you have uprisings of indigenous peoples, subject peoples, in the Indian mutiny, as we still call it as a classic example, in repressing that, People will always accuse the rebels of murdering babies and raping women. It's a it's a tried and tested tactic throughout the ages to dehumanize people and to, to portray them as savages, as Marco Rubio actually calls the Palestinians in our film. And given that that is such an established historical pattern, again, it's quite remarkable in the days and weeks after October the 7th that more people in the Western media didn't hear some alarm bells ringing about the rhetoric that was being used about what had supposedly happened on October the 7th. That was Richard Sanders, whose Al Jazeera documentary will be out later this week. Um, We'll be doing uh, more coverage of that documentary when it is out, because there's lots of really, really significant content in that I think you're you'll like to see. Jonathan Glazer is a British director whose latest movie has won Best International Feature Film at the Academy Awards. The Zone of Interest is a study of how incredibly ordinary people can live normal lives while carrying out horrific brutality, like the Holocaust. And in his acceptance speech, Glazer made this connection between his film and recent events in Gaza. All our choices were made to reflect and confront us in the present, not to say, look what they did then, rather look what we do now. Our film shows where dehumanization leads at its worst. It shaped all of our past and present. Right now, we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people. Whether the victims of October the... (laughs) Whether the victims of October the 7th in Israel or the ongoing attack on Gaza, all the victims of this dehumanization. How do we resist? (laughs) Alexandra Bistron Kaladziejczyk, the girl who glows in the film as she did in life, chose to. I dedicate this to her memory and her resistance. That's a really powerful intervention. It was immediately misrepresented. So Batya Ungar Sargon is opinion editor at Newsweek. She said this, I simply cannot fathom the moral rot in someone's soul that leads them to win an award for a movie about the Holocaust and with the platform given to them to accept that award by saying, we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness. Now, that is an absolute misrepresentation of what he said, which would be very obvious to you from seeing the speech, right? Um, He didn't refute his Jewishness, he refuted his Jewishness being used to justify a genocidal war against another people. It's completely, completely ridiculous, that kind of misrepresentation. Very, very powerful speech. Also, it was sort of noted that he didn't sort of tag that onto an end of a speech so it could be cut by news organizations, sort of right at the beginning. Um, And yeah, super powerful. I haven't yet seen the film, but everyone who's told me about it says it's absolutely Amazing. I mean, it wasn't just Jonathan Glazer bringing up Gaza at the Oscars this weekend. Pro-Palestinian protesters made their presence felt too, blocking traffic to the Dolby Theatre where the awards are held and shouting shame at those heading for the ceremony. Police were out in extra numbers, threatening arrests for what they called unlawful assembly. The protests caused some Oscar arrivals to be delayed by as much as an hour, and one of those held up was actor Mark Ruffalo. Shut down the Oscars tonight. Humanity wins. Really cool kind of way to go into the Oscars. Like it, it was it was impressive, not just that speech that you saw from, from the director, but also, I mean, the reaction was very positive, right? So it does seem like potentially something is shifting, 
I mean, very much belatedly, um, you know, the American establishment, we, we're seeing what the government is doing. Um, and it's, you know, it's not like there's this huge national revolt against Joe Biden, sort of not just tacitly supporting a genocidal war, I mean, actively sort of enabling um, a genocidal war. But it is interesting that you are seeing um, more people sort of in Hollywood being willing to stand up against this. And of course, while the Academy Awards were taking place in Hollywood, a very different occasion and was being marked on the other side of the world in Jerusalem. Hundreds of Muslim Palestinians tried to attend the Al-Aqsa Mosque for prayers on the eve of the holy month of Ramadan. As a crowd of worshippers waited to enter the mosque, they're stormed um, by Israeli police. And you can see here that leads to a crush of people trying to escape. Officers, as you can see, um, then hit people with their batons and throw them to the ground. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is the world's third holiest Islamic site, but Israel controls access to it before Ramadan began. Benjamin Netanyahu's government said it would not curtail freedom of worship. And yet, according to Israeli newspaper Haaretz, dozens of restraining orders were issued against Palestinian activists and journalists in recent days. Israeli police were also reportedly ordered to stop young Muslims from entering. It's a situation that Jordan's foreign minister described as designed to push the crisis in Palestine towards, quote, explosion. Where is the Princess of Wales? That's one question on the nation's lips after a bodged attempt to prove all is well in the House of Windsor. The mystery concerns Kate Middleton, who hasn't appeared in public since Christmas and who we're told had routine abdominal surgery in mid-January. The absence of clear information about her whereabouts or health has led some wild conspiracy theories to emerge online and to try to put them to bed the palace released an image over the weekend of princess kate and her children um, so it was sent um, from the family's twitter account with a caption thank you for your kind wishes and continued support over the last two months wishing everyone a happy mother's day c um, so c being Catherine, and then they give the photo credit to the prince of wales 2024 now, initially, that photo was welcomed by royal watchers. Jenny Bond is the former royal correspondent at the BBC. Each year they post on Mother's Day a picture with uh, children and, and Catherine together. And, yeah, my first reaction was, phew, goodness me, she looks fine. Um, and it's a full-length picture. Otherwise, we'll probably have other conspiracy theories that she had, you know, had her legs chopped off or something. <laughs> um, you know, she, she looks fine. She's got all her limbs. She's wearing quite a tight pair of jeans, which after abdominal surgery suggests that, you know, she's, she's feeling a bit more comfortable. She looks happy. The kids look relaxed. So um, it, it is a relief to see that picture. So Jenny Bond for the image was finally confirmation that all was well with the royals. It was a relief. Um, but the internet, as you'll probably know by now, had other ideas. Twitter users zoomed in on parts of the photo that didn't make any sense. Um, you can see here the sleeve of Kate's daughter blend into her skirt in a way which is very, very obviously edited because it defies the laws of physics. Um, and by Sunday evening, major news agencies withdrew the photo, confirming it had been doctored. This is how Sky broke the story. This is all really strange and, you know, happening as we speak. But let me explain what we do know. We have some uh, respected international news agencies deciding to kill this photo. In other words, they are pulling it from their distribution websites because they believe it has been changed, altered, Photoshop. Call it what you like. They don't believe this is the photo in its original form. Now, Associated Press has, has, is among those who've decided to, to kill this photo, to pull it. They're saying at closer inspection, it appears that the source has manipulated the image. Now, remember, the source of this photo, we were told by Kensington Palace, was Prince William himself. He took this photo uh, in Windsor last week. He is behind it. So the Prince of Wales, our future king no less, has been found to have authored some faked photographs. This is not the way to put conspiracy theories to rest. Um, the royal household then presumably had a stressful night working out how to rescue all of this um, and they came up with this. So by Monday morning, the princess, well, it's, it's from the Kensington uh, Royal Twitter account, like many amateur photographers, I do occasionally experiment with editing. I want to express my apologies for any confusion the family photograph we shared yesterday caused. I hope everyone celebrating had a very happy Mother's Day. See, um, so it's supposed to be from Kate. Um, of course, we had been told uh, the photo was authored by um, Prince Charles, or I suppose, not Charles, sorry, Will William. I suppose we could imagine Prince William took the photo and then 
the, uh, the, the Princess of Wales had a go at editing it, this incredibly normal family who do everything themselves. Um, that was not nearly good enough for the internet to quash any rumours, as you would imagine. Um, but we do now seem to have an update. So this was um, from Sky at around half three today. We have a new image uh, in the last few minutes, which has just been released, well, was just taken off, uh, apparently of the Princess of Wales and the Prince of Wales together in a car, uh, pictured leaving one of, of the royal palaces. So that photo has not yet been revealed to have been doctored. But interestingly, you still didn't see Kate's face. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm not here to say it wasn't Kate, but if you wanted to prove this person was, you know, existing, um, was okay, maybe a picture of her face moving would be a bit more you know, reassuring to the people who are worried than a picture from within a car of her looking in the other direction. Um, Helena, how far down the hashtag Kate Middleton rabbit hole are you at the moment? I mean, when it first came out, immediately I was like, oh, what's going on here, right? This is, this is, nothing here is kosher. But then I actually, you know, so I think the original image is either an old image or it's just completely fabricated. Like, again, what, when have they ever put out photos for public consumption that hadn't gone through all of the channels, right? We all know about the royal road by now and just how much, how much surveying of all of the potential press images of the royals has to go through who gets access to all of these different photos. The idea that it just came from Prince William and was just edited on the side by Kate, I, absolute nonsense bullshit, do not believe a word of it. And then all of the conspiracy theories have been going on, but I'm trying to take a critical eye with this. And I think in my mind, the real what's really going on here is they just needed something, as we've as we said, to kind of quell people theorizing about her potential ill health or whatever. And I think really and truly, it's probably just that she is still recovering, doesn't really feel up to being in the public eye and just wants a bit of time off. And we know from all that's gone with Harry and Meghan in the background, we know just how absolutely rabid the press are to be in on the royal gossip 100% of the time. So just having something they can put out for column inches, for there to be segments done for all of the all of the royal specialists on YouTube to have that little go at producing content for all the views because that's really and truly what the press what the sorry what the royals have to give up in their royal duties is being a kind of a, a vector for the press to be able to make money from and that is what the royal road to agreement is basically for and so you know the release of that latest picture of like sort of the back of her head what do who is that who is that for and I think actually it's written for the papers. It's, it is for the papers because all of the gossip, all of the theorizing, all of the discourse that's happening in the background, the one thing that it will allow people to do is get people to click on their links to their news website so they can have adverts targeted at them. And I think really and truly the actual, the simple part is what's happening with Kate. I think she's just recovering still and she'll be back after Easter or something to, to resume her royal duties. But all of the discourse that's going on, all of the coyness about what photos do get released and what don't, I think this is purely for the press. Well, if it's, I mean, you, you, you must not have been on Twitter this weekend because there are a lot of people who are enjoying this story who don't edit national newspapers. Uh, the, the speculation on this is wild and it does seem to some degree grassroots. I kind of have the impression that people feel like our taxes pay for their concerns. So we might as well make this into some sort of real life Kardashian-style soap opera, and people seem to be enjoying the conspiracy theories somewhat. I'm finding them moderately entertaining. Um, many of the rumours surrounding Kate's absence have concerned her health, obviously less entertaining than the other um, conspiracy theories concerning Brazilian butt lifts or Willy Wonka land in Glasgow. Um, one of the rumours about her health includes a Spanish journalist who swears by her source who says Kate is in a medically induced coma um, but there are also rumours circulating that Kate's failure to appear in public could be due to relationship problems between her and Prince William. And The Independent published an intriguing profile on their website today. So it's headlined, Lady Rose Hanbury, who is the Marchioness of Cholmondeley. <laughs> These people are ridiculous. Uh, you can see uh, that tweet there has been viewed 4.4 million times. Now, that might seem odd for a profile of the Marchioness of Charles Mondelet, who I doubt many of you have heard of before. Um, but most of those views are people quote tweeting the story and speculating on why the Independent has shared this article at this particular moment. Um, now, I've read the piece. There is nothing obviously contemporary 
about it. And the internet is awash with speculation about the, re- the relationship sorry, of Lady Hanbury to both Kate and Prince William. Now, I'm not an expert on uh, the royal relationships, um, but you can go Google, you can go look on Twitter if you enjoy going down these rabbit holes. Um, we will wrap up there. Helena, thank you so much for joining me this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. Thank you very much for having me. Look forward to next time. And thank you all for tuning in. Um, you've been watching Navarro Media. Good night.